Welcome to Union Christian Church Online. We want your time with us to be as engaging as possible. So if you have any questions after the service, please contact us on our website and someone from our staff will reach out to you. If you need assistance in picking up groceries or medicine, please contact the church at this email address and someone will contact you directly. As a staff and leadership, we are here to serve you in any way that we can. For all of you who have made a commitment to tithe to UCC, we ask that you follow the link at the bottom of the screen to do that online, or if you still prefer the mail, send it to this address listed below. Also starting this week and moving forward, we will have a designated time during the service for you to partake in communion with your family. If you would like to go ahead and get that ready so you won't miss out, please do so now. Again, thank you for choosing to be with us today. Now let's get ready to worship Jesus direct from our homes as we join the UCC Worship Band. Son of God proved His love that while we were sinners Jesus died for us. No more shame, no more fear our Savior is alive forever. God is near. Christ the Lord is risen today. Lamb of God has taken our sins away. Love's redeeming work is done. Raise your voice. The King has Like him, like him will rise as the cross, the grave, the sky. Christ the Lord is risen today. Lamb of God has taken our sins away. Love's redeeming word. Just hold on 
for the morning break to dawn. Come and lay your burdens down to the place where freedom is found at the feet, at the feet of Jesus. Come and lay your burdens down When the deepest sorrow wears on your heart When you prayed for answers but the answers never come For every tear that you cry there's a promise He will make your burdens light Come and lay your burdens down To the place where freedom is found At the feet, at the feet of Jesus Come and lay your burdens down Oh, lay them down Ooh. Lay them down oh. When we see Him face to face All our worries Surely fade away In the presence Of His glorious light Sing hallelujah To the one who gave us love Come and lay your burdens down To the place where A number of years ago, Norman Cousins wrote an editorial in which he reported a conversation that he had on a trip to India. You see, he was talking with a Hindu priest named Satas Prasad, and the man said that he would like to come to our country to work as a missionary among the Americans. Now, Cousins assumed that uh, what he meant was that he wanted to convert Americans to the Hindu religion. But when asked, the priest said this. He said, oh no, I, I would like to convert them to the Christian religion. Christianity cannot survive in the abstract. It needs not membership, but believers. You see, the people of your country may claim they believe in Christianity, but from what I see at this distance, Christianity is more accustomed than anything else. And so I would ask them, either you accept the teachings of Jesus in your everyday life, and in your affairs as a nation, or stop invoking his name as a sanction for everything you do. I, I want to help save Christianity for the Christian. That story is kind of somber when we hear it, uh, but it tells a truth. You see, one of the greatest tragedies of today's society is the lack of commitment to anything. One of the greatest needs of the church is for mature Christians who are committed to growing in the Lord. And today, uh, we're going to continue our series in the book of Colossians. And, and in our text for today, we're going to actually see how Paul shows us what a mature and committed servant of God looks like. So we're going to be in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. And I want to start us off. I love how Paul starts this out in verse 1. He says, I, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. You see, Paul wanted these people to know the depth of his love and concern for them. Uh, he had a real pastor's heart for other believers, 
even mature Christians need leaders who struggle in per- prayer and, 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 and are concerned for them. You see, having mature leadership is one of the best ways for God's people to attain further maturity. I mean, if you take a half-hearted, half-committed pastor or leader, they are probably going to produce a half-hearted and half-committed people. And as Paul uses the word struggle here, he means that he's striving, agonizing and wrestling in prayer for other believers that they might grow and mature in the Lord. It's the picture of an athlete, if you will, exerting every ounce of energy as he, as he struggles to, to finish the contest. You see, prayer is not easy. It's a work. In fact, it's, it's demanding and, and, and difficult. If you actually take prayer seriously, uh, you'll, you'll know from experience that it's a struggle. I mean, when you get serious about praying, uh, you'll find that your thoughts will sometimes wonder. You'll find that your thoughts will struggle against your desire to be obedient in prayer. Your old nature will stick its ugly head out. You'll uh, imagine things while trying to concentrate on praying. Uh, your pride will get in the way of your prayers uh, so that something other than God is actually exalted. Your work schedule will seem to get in the way of your prayer schedule. Your, your desire for leisure time will seem to interfere with your prayer time. But if we have the spirit of God within us, uh, we actually have this nature within us. Uh, consequently, we have the power within us to overcome any such distractions and the influence of the evil one. We can find victory over such things as we persevere in a life uh, that's committed to the Lord. In, in fact, uh, that is the will of the Lord for us. Now, many Christians and churches remain immature in the Lord because they fail to labor and agonize in prayer for one another. You see, the Lord reveals himself to those who constantly seek his face in prayer. Prayer and close communion and fellowship with the Lord is one of the primary ways in which God blesses his people. And indeed, Paul's struggling for God's people. It shows us the depth of his love for them. As he loved them, he had good things in mind for them. I mean, previously in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul had said he wanted to present everyone perfect in Christ. That's why he struggled for them in prayer. So as he struggled toward uh, that end, Paul wrote of four things within today's text that he wanted for God's people at Colossia. First, Paul wanted the Colossians to be strong in heart. Now look at our main text at the first part of, of, of verse two. It says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. Now, this is not a, a mere reference to a person's emotions because often when the Bible uses the word heart, it, it simply is referring to the person's inner self. Uh, but Paul here, he refers uh, here to having an inner strength that comes from knowing the Lord. So when Paul says he wants them to be encouraged in heart, he means that he wanted them to be mature people with hearts that are strong and confident and assured. He wanted them to have the, the kind of strength that enables a person to withstand trials and temptations and false teachings. He, he wanted them to have the kind of strength that comforts and builds assurance and confidence in life, both now and eternally. You see, the human heart aches for such strength, for that kind of confidence and assurance and comfort. Strong hearts don't come from religion or ceremony or, or rituals or laws or rules or regulations. So if they don't come from there, where then does an encouraged, strengthened heart come from? Well, it comes from love. You see, Paul wanted the Colossians to be strong in heart. But secondly, Paul wanted the Colossians to be united together in love. Look at it. I'm going to read verse 2 again. It says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in what? In love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Strong and encouraged hearts get that way by being united with other believing hearts in love. Ask yourself this. Have you ever felt lonely? Like nobody cared? Have you ever experienced neglect? Have you ever felt like you just don't fit in or like others just ignore you? You see, when we feel emotions like that, we seldom feel strong or confident or assured. 
in fact, just the opposite is true. We actually feel weak or, or unacceptable or incapable. Such insecurity either causes us to withdraw or it causes us to react with a phony superior attitude as we try to hide our insecurity. You see, we've all felt or seen such reactions. The point is this, the answer to a strong and confident and assured heart is love. Being joined together with others in love. If you think about it, wasn't that a command of Jesus to the church? To love each other, to build one another up, to, to, to build love among ourselves, to build love among all people, not neglecting or overlooking or ignoring a single person. You see, when Christian hearts are bound together in love, the heart of each individual believer is going to be strengthened and encouraged and assured and comforted. Here's what I love about this church. Love produces unity. Love confirms us. Love reinforces us. Love welds us together. And when we're welded together, we are one together. The result is that we're stronger together, better able to resist false teaching and the schemes of the, of the devil. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. You see, the love that the Lord wants us to have for one another is based in humility. Love isn't just some warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is actually action. First John tells us that love sacrifices for others. Love uh, it sees others as better than ourselves. Love is willing to meet others' needs first. Uh, when we give and receive love on those terms, the emotions that accompany love will surely follow. So Paul, he wanted the Colossians to be strong in heart. He wanted them to be united together in love. And third, Paul wanted the Colossians to have a complete understanding. Look at verses two through five of our main text. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how, uh, how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. You see, Paul wanted all the believers to have the full riches of that complete understanding. These words were written so that we also might experience the fullness of God's storehouse of grace, the treasures of the blessings in Christ that are available and acceptable to every true believer. And Paul wanted every Christian to experience the God who really exists. He wanted us to know the, the God who is interested in the affairs of his people. He wanted men and women everywhere to know that they can, that they can know God in a personal way through his son, Jesus. Paul wanted the Colossians and all of us everywhere to know that eternity exists and that heaven is a real place. He wanted men and women in every age to know and understand the mystery of God. I love how that's, that, that comes alive, that, that word, the mystery. It means a secret, a secret of God that he has now revealed. Now, what is the great secret of God that has now been revealed? Well, well verse two, look at it. It simply says the mystery of God, namely Christ. Listen to me, church. Jesus is the mystery of God. It is Jesus Christ that reveals God to men. When people look at Jesus, they see God. When people come to know Jesus, they come to know God personally. To know Jesus is, as verse three says, to know all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He alone is sufficient. He alone is the source of all spiritual knowledge. And Paul writes these things to the Colossians because there were these false teachers among them with all this fine sounding arguments that he mentions in verse four. And a couple thousand years have passed, but it is the same today. You see, there are still lots of false teachers who have all these fine sounding arguments among us. And because of that, we must have settled convictions about Jesus's deity and his sufficiency to guard against them. Coming to, save, uh, coming to saving faith isn't the end. And that's the problem sometimes because sometimes we see it as the end, but 
It's actually just the beginning of a life lived for Christ. You see, God gives us his Holy Spirit and the Spirit gives us assurance that we truly know God and are adopted as his sons and daughters. You see, we know with absolute assurance that what we believe about our Lord is accurate because his spirit has instilled that confidence and understanding within our hearts. Even though the believers of the Colossian church were being attacked by false teaching, they were responding in in phenomenal victory, right? They, They were holding their order and standing firm. And Paul was pleased. He wanted them to know and understand that. So he says this in verse five. He says, For though I am absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. You see, mature people, they persevere. They maintain their discipline, their order and their steadfastness. And Paul wanted the Colossians to be strong in heart. He wanted them uh, to be united together in love. He, He wanted them to have a complete understanding. And fourth, he wanted the Colossians to live for the Lord. Look at verses six and seven of our main text. It says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Question, are are you perfect? I'm not. I mean, some people may act like it and some of you might know someone who thinks they're perfect, but they really aren't. I mean, I don't think any Christian is, at least not this side of eternity. And salvation isn't about being perfect in this age. Salvation is about receiving a person and that person, my friends, is Jesus Christ. You see, he leads us and he guides us in the direction of perfection, Uh, but we'll not have that until we reach heaven one day. As for now, uh, what happens is we are covered by Christ's perfection, even though we fall short on our own. So thankfully, God sees Christ's perfection when he looks at us. Ask yourself and be really honest with your answer here. Are you living your life in a way that is worthy of his holy calling? Look at our main text again in verse six. It says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Where are we supposed to live this Christian life? Uh, Do we just live it in church on Sunday morning? No. And that's what Paul's saying here. You see, we must live it out in public. Uh, We live it at our schools. We live it at work. Uh, We live it in the post office or at the grocery store or the gas station. But we must also live it in private where very few see us. You see, we need to live it at home. We need to live it before our family. Uh, Wherever we are living at any given moment in time, Those of us who know Christ ought to be living in Christ. Uh, There are some wonderful word pictures here in verse six. Uh, Verse six says we are to be rooted in Jesus. Now I want you to to picture this if you can for a moment, this majestic tree within your mind. You see, the believer is to be like a towering tree that has its roots deeply planted in the ground. Uh, Jesus uh, is the ground that gives us strength against wind and storms. Uh, This tree actually reminds me uh, of the the big old tree that sits in front of the church office. It's branches, they reach high towards heaven. And as we're rooted in Jesus, we ought to be reaching toward heaven. And and the branches of that big tree, they reach outwards in all directions. And likewise, as, as we're rooted in Jesus, we ought to be reaching outward to others. And the roots of that big tree, they, they reach deep down into the ground. And similarly, we need to be deepening our roots in the Lord for it is he, listen to me church, it is Jesus who nourishes and sustains us. And verse six also says that we are to, uh, to be built up in him. Now that brings to, to mind for me the picture of a house being built. As a former brick mason, the, the first thing we would start with when building a house was a strong foundation. And Paul tells us in Ephesians uh, 2 uh, verse 20 that Jesus is the cornerstone of our foundation of faith. He is the only sure foundation in this world. Having received Christ, we are to live in him with our faith resting upon him. You see, a mature believer is a person who has built his entire life upon Jesus. So what's your life built upon? 
Listen, church, coming to Christ is only the beginning. And as we receive him as Lord, as, as we live in him, uh, uh, we are rooted in him, we are built up in him. And consequently, we receive the strengthening of the faith that he wants us to have as we persevere in him. And the blessings we receive from a life lived for our Lord will surely return to him in the form of what? In the form of our praise and our adoration to him. In fact, what does verse seven say? It says that we should be overflowing with thankfulness. You see, these things we have looked at today are pictures of spiritual growth. If your spiritual roots are, are deep in Christ, you won't want any other soil. If Jesus is your sure foundation, you have no need to move. If you're reading and growing in God's word, you won't be led astray by false doctrine. If your heart is overflowing with thanksgiving, you'll never consider turning from the fullness you have in Jesus. Listen to me, church. Seek out your foundation in Christ. Be grounded in your faith. Be growing in your knowledge of the things of God and be grateful for all that God has done and will do in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossia. And we thank you for the example that that church set and the encouragement that, that Paul continues to give them as we see this throughout this series. He continues to pray for them and con continues to encourage them to stay strong. And Father, I pray now for all those who are listening to uh, this message this morning uh, that they stay strong and that they stay unified and that they continue to keep their eye on the, on the prize, which is you, Father. And that continue to move forward and stay strong. Father, we love you and, and we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for, for all that you do for us. And Father, I thank you for, for sending Jesus, sending him here to live as a man and to die on a cross so that all of us listening, for everyone, Father, everyone in the world could have the opportunity to accept you as Lord and Savior and have eternal life with you one day. What a promise. There is no better promise than that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you, Father, and we pray all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. When he told you you're not good, Enough. When he told you you're not right When he told you you're not strong enough To put up a good fight When he told you you're not worthy When he told you you're not loved When he told you you're not beautiful Never be enough your breath stop you in your steps fear he is a liar he will rob your rest steal your happiness cast your fear in the fire cause fear Liar. When he told you you were troubled, you'd forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'd never find a home. When he told you you were dirty and you should be ashamed. When he told you you could be the one. The grace could never change Oh, fear He is a liar He will take your breath Stop you in your 
your fire fall and cast out all my fears let your fire fall your love is all I feel let your fire fall and cast out all my fears let your fire fall your love is all I let your fire fall and cast out all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel to our time of communion. I'm Joe. This is my wife, Jen. This is a time to reflect on what Jesus has done for each of us. Often in the spring, and certainly this spring, with our lengthy stay at home, many of us have found ourselves doing a little spring cleaning. Maybe you've cleaned out your closets, your junk drawer, organized your desk, or like us, cleaned out your garage. So why do we do spring cleaning? We find every so often we need to get rid of things that we've accumulated things that are taking up needed space. As I think about it, as we prepare for communion, I believe that it's a, a little like spring cleaning. We come to the Father to confess and get rid of what we shouldn't have in our lives. This is a time to admit mistakes, to take inventory of what is important, to clean our hearts. 1 Corinthians 11.27 says this about our preparation for communion. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Spring cleaning is good, but a heart cleansing is necessary to commune with our Heavenly Father. Let's clean our hearts as we go to the Father. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this uh, day and this time that we come together uh, just to reflect on your great love, spilling your blood on Calvary's Hill for us, Father. What a tremendous sacrifice. And this morning we take these emblems, the cup for the, cup for the shed blood and the loaf for the broken body. As we take these emblems, let us remember of that tremendous sacrifice, Father. And help us to clean up our lives to make more room for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, let's continue in our worship.
give life You are love You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore Every heart that is broken And great are you, Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise Pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we Shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you Cry, these bones will sing. Red.